And welcome to uh, day two of Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, we're excited to be hosting this panel on the social impact implications of blockchain, crypto, and NFTs. And you are in for a treat because we have got an amazing group of people to talk with us here today. Um, but first, I just wanted to um, welcome, we have the Carlson Center led by Cameron Law, and I see Arlene um, on the call as well. So thank you uh, to the Carlson Center for leading us through uh, what, what's going to be an awesome Global Entrepreneurship Week. And, um, we partner with them on this uh, panel uh, in years past. So I'm Monique Brown, a managing director of a new nonprofit early stage accelerator called the Growth Factory here in Sacramento um, with an accompanying venture fund. And we're on a mission to um, kind of ignite the entrepreneurial revolution here in the Sacramento region, investing in our fantastic founders. Um, I'm excited to be joined, um, and I'm gonna turn it over to him now here, uh, by Joe Tricolo. He's founder of the AML and Comp Comply Fit, and we're really lucky to have him as one of our Growth Factory mentors. Um, and Joe, I would love for you to give a little introduction about you and what you do and how you came to the space and then take it away with the panel. Uh, and I'll be here to uh, facilitate questions in chat and uh, let me know if you need me, but otherwise take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much, Monique. And, and thanks folks for joining us uh, here as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week. We appreciate the hospitality and we have a really exciting panel to introduce in a moment. Uh, myself first, uh, Joe Chicolo. I'm the founder of BitAML uh, and the co-founder of ComplyFit. Uh, on the BitAML side, we do regulatory compliance consulting uh, and have done so over the past six plus years for entrepreneurs in the crypto space that are engaging in any number of uh, uh, matters that are regulated and under the wing of compliance, uh, be that exchanges, Bitcoin ATMs, traders, trading platforms, crypto hedge funds, and the alike. Uh, and with ComplyFit, offering uh, a SaaS platform solution for managing uh, state licenses, both for crypto and traditional money remittances companies. Uh, and again, working very much with entrepreneurs and, and quite often is the case, uh, entrepreneurs are, are uh, we're one of the second or third calls they make uh, in setting up their business. So very familiar with that entrepreneurial journey, both for ourselves uh, as a company and myself, uh, but as well uh, day in and day out working with our clients. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined by an amazing panel and I'd like to go around the, the Zoom or virtual room uh, and have each of our panelists give a, a short introduction as I have uh, to the, for themselves and for their business. And so uh, I guess we'll start uh, ladies first, Sonia, if you wanna give a quick uh, self introduction and then from there, uh, we can kind of popcorn around the virtual room. Sorry about that. I heard myself talk until I realized I was on mute. My name is Sonia Coopwood. I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer for Green Tech. Green Tech is a renewable energy development company, and we also have our own cryptocurrency that we listed on the Probit Exchange, which is trading. We listed it back in May. So um, I've been in the commercial construction industry for well over 28 years. I started my career in underground construction to above ground construction. I have a degree in marketing and um, I don't know how long you wanna talk, but basically I'm the face of our company and looking to make a difference and uh, in the renewable energy space, utilizing our green, we call it the green cryptocurrency and we'll talk more about it as um, Joe's nice enough to ask us questions. All right, thanks, Sonia. Um, Sadell? All right, awesome. Happy to be here. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone, for uh, joining in. And um, thanks to, to Joe, Monique, and, and Cameron, and the rest of the organizing team here. Uh, my name is Sadell Trubovsky. I'm the CEO and co founder at Open Grants. Um, and we streamline access to trillions of dollars in funding for the world's most important work. Um, one of the really exciting things we're working on right now is actually using crypto rails to deliver direct aid to low resource countries and environments around the world. Um, so we're really excited about the implications that has for helping societies really leapfrog from traditional banking infrastructure into uh, DeFi. Um, and we do have our own grant uh, token as well um, that is part of our approach to stakeholder capitalism and really 
extending economic opportunities to a, a much larger group of, of individuals. So really excited to be here. I'm <clears throat> personally myself a, a four-time uh, founder, uh, serial entrepreneur, and uh, very much you know bullish not only on on this region here in Sacramento, but um, also on on the future of decentralized finance. So super excited to be here. Great, thanks, Adele. Uh, Jeremy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Jeremy De La Rosa. I'm the founder and CEO of Leyline NFTs for Good, um, and uh, I'm a I've been in the tech sector for about 20 years now. I spent the last 10 years over at Blizzard Entertainment, so very heavy in the video game and tech world, um, and was inspired to come into Web3, understanding the possibilities for social change. And uh, what we're trying to build with Leyline is actually mashing together NFT collectibles and avatars with play to earn gaming and redirecting all of that towards social good and promoting uh, donations and volunteerism. Uh, so yeah, happy to talk more about that uh, in session. Awesome, fantastic. And last and certainly not least, uh, Vernon. Hey, what's going on guys? Joe and Monique, thank you so much for having me. It's, 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 a, it's been awesome so far meeting with everybody. I'm excited for what uh, for the gems we're going to be dropping. And uh, so my name is Vernon Jay. I'm the founder of Equity Coin. We are the first digital token on the blockchain backed by affordable housing. I've been in the in the multifamily real estate space for 16 years, um, investing myself for seven years. I got into blockchain about six years ago. Got in heavy, um, traveled the world, learning about how. Uh, real estate and blockchain intersect and try to figure out where where to where the value lies. And it wasn't until around around February of last year where we started renting out some of our units to recently homeless families using programs like City Faps in New York and, and also Section 8. And when the moment, you know, the first time we handed the keys to uh, a recently homeless woman with her young son, you know, she broke down in, in the craziest tears. It, it, the, the gratitude just poured from her, it, from her soul pretty much because, you know, and at that point, I, I never felt more purposeful. And I, my, my goal from that, from that moment was to figure out how I can do that a thousand times over. And uh, pretty much what, what we figured out is that by, by, tackling, by tapping into the blockchain, um, we're able to exponentially grow uh, holdings and then also allow people within the communities that have been margin historically marginalized, give them an opportunity to invest, and then also give uh, uh, community developers the opportunity to uh, get funding where it, it, it's an alternative to the banks. So right now we, um, uh, we launched uh, January of, of this year um, and we're ex I'm excited to talk about it. I'm excited to, to uh, talk about the sharing equity economy. Fantastic. And, and as I think our audience can pick up already, there's some amazing stories to be told here. And we're certainly gonna dive deeper into blockchain and crypto and even NFTs. Uh, as we go on, but I think I want to start off by taking maybe a little bit of a step back and taking a bigger picture view and talking more about the entrepreneurial journey. So uh, I think we'll start with you, uh, uh, Sonia, maybe you can give us a, a little bit of a, of a discussion as to, you know, your story in the entrepreneurial journey and, and in the context of, of your company uh, and the project you're working on. And then we'll, again, go around the, uh, the virtual room here. Sure. So first of all, I think that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to have thick skin because you're going to get rejected on a lot of things, whether it's funding or your idea. The second um, advice I would have for those listening would be, you're going to want to have stamina. For you to get your project from A to Z requires a lot of hard work and stamina. And you just cannot give up if, if indeed that's part of your journey. However, I will say, that the other thing is as an entrepreneur, you can get easily distracted in many, many different ways. So I would keep your eye on the ball and really stay focused on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. For example, we are a renewable energy development company and we are going to change the way wind energy is delivered to the market. So we have a revolutionary vertical access wind turbine that we are going to be connected to the Southern California Edison grid and sell power. And so the reason, so my story on that is, is ever since other countries such as Australia, 
um, like Korea, the government from Korea was just in our office. Um, we are in discussions with um, a group out of the Bahamas. So there's a lot of people that want what we have, okay? And so we can easily get distracted, but you have to stay focused on really finishing up what your objective is as an entrepreneur. And then the other key word that I would have is scaling up, okay? So then you have to have a scaling up strategy because otherwise you're gonna be just running with your pants on fire and really not accomplishing what it is that you are, are, are set out to do. Um, the other the other advice that I would have, um, and again, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, Joe, you just talked about being an entrepreneur, but the other thing is, is that Rome wasn't built in a day. And um, you, you know, you've got to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, okay? So if, if I don't know what kind of corporation you are or what kind of structure your company is, if you have a board of directors or advisory committee, but as you scale up, it's very, very important to have an advisory committee because multiple minds are much uh, smarter and wiser as you're growing your company um, in, in that respect. And so, so, and then as far as the crypto side of our company, I'm just telling you right now, um, hold on and don't be scared and understand that you're entering into the space that what I refer to as the wild, wild west, as a lot of people do. Uh, that, that industry is changing very, very quickly. And so again, um, Joe, just talking about anyone that might be interested in being an entrepreneur in that space, I would have to say that you absolutely get your best pair of running shoes on um, because the market is moving that fast. You cannot walk around in this industry with slippers on. Uh, there's events going on every day, every week across the country, and things are moving very, very fast. So I would highly recommend that you position yourself uh, to, to, like I said, have a lot of energy, stamina, and to be able to keep up with with the trends if you're if you're thinking about going into the crypto space. But Joe, does that kind of answer your question? I wasn't. Yeah, no, very good. I appreciate the the context and the perspective of your entrepreneurial journey. I I, I sort of want to segue over to, to Sadal and, and uh, tell us as a serial entrepreneur, it gets much easier, right? Every time you launch a new business, it's, it must be exponentially yeah. easier. You know everything. So what's what's your journey been like? You know, four x. Uh, in other words, having gone through it four times. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that um, you know it's nice. I, I did tell my a remark to my wife the other night that it is nice on Company Four that I feel like. I do know uh, a little bit about what I'm doing from like an operational standpoint. Um, you know, every time it's different and exciting and because you're pushing the boundaries on something new, you know, I, I'll double down on what Sonia said, like focus is key. Um, that is the, the watchword focus and over communication are the things that I, you know, hammer into the team time and time again. But, you know, I started, uh, I dropped out of law school became a river guide, kind of traveled around the world for a while and, you know, realized I wanted to have some kind of, of impact. And as I looked for ways that I could, you know, do that and advance a, a few of the things that really interested me, um, one of one of the main ones was economic empowerment. You know, I, I figured out that like startups was the way to go. That's that's where I could have the most impact. Um, and so I think um, uh, apart from focus and having stamina, it's it's about doing things that, you know, that you're really interested in doing, at, at least for me, that's the, that's the reason to do this. You know, I could, I could go uh, sit down and uh, I'm very lucky and privileged to be able to, you know, I could go work at a fan company and make a quarter million dollars a year and retire in five years and call it a day. Um, but, you know, this is way more, way more fun. And, and I'm excited and stoked every time I get out of bed in the morning and get to work on this problem. So I, for me, that's the thing. It's like work on stuff that's meaningful to you that makes you really excited. It doesn't have to be like saving the world. Maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's something else, but like for you, it has to, it has to like have that same kind of feeling, right. That you're like, Oh, I'm doing something really important. That's meaningful. Uh, otherwise I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> I love that. And I love that energy. And, and not only does it go with the themes of, of this panel, but just in general to have something that is really meaningful for you, as you put it, Sadal, that's just really driving force behind uh, and, and giving you that energy you need day to day. And, and speaking of energy during our introductions, I think Vernon really uh, captured the audience there with uh, with some of the things he's working on. So I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll sort of bring over the next question to you, uh, Vernon, in the context of sort of, or the confluence rather of, of social impact and, 
and entrepreneurship. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and sort of how the two came together for you and how that's a driving force for you in entrepreneurship. Well, I think right now what we're seeing in the market is just a natural convergence of social, you know, social equity and entrepreneurship. I think, you know, with the advent or, you know, the, the new sharing equity economy that I like to call it with Uber, where, you know, 15 years ago, you would have called me crazy if I told you that you were going to be riding in a stranger's car or that you can use your vehicle as a means to pay your rent, right? If, if you're not a taxi driver, you know, back, back then the taxi commissions had all uh, had the power and it was a complete monopoly, you know, but now we've opened up, you know, Uber, you've got Airbnb, same, same thing. If I told you you're going to sleep in a stranger's home, you're crazy, right? But now it's, it's just, it's just a way of life. So I think the birth of that sharing equity economy kind of gave way to uh, this notion that you can create a product that can actually bring people together instead of uh, bringing them apart. And I think with blockchain, we're, we're gonna start to see the sharing equity economy 2.0 where it's, where it's decentralized, you know, where you're, you're, you're not, you know, you're not beholden to a specific company or a bank or a centralized centralized place. You, you can actually share in uh, the value of that of that asset or or of that you know property or anything anything uh, of that of that sort. So I think it's a natural progression uh, that we're seeing here. And and I just want to touch on that that last question as well. You know, uh, my my first I think I was lucky that I started early. Uh, my first startup when I was 21 years old. It was, it was a company called Live Open House where we transformed storefronts into touchscreens. Um, and I had clients all over, all over the world, um, all over the country, all over the world. And the, what I would tell people, anybody listening right now, um, is that you, know, you, you hear these stories, you watch uh, you know, the social network, you watch these, these movies, and you seem to think that you can come from a place of complete weakness and create something great, which has happened. It, it is a possibility. The, the chances are very slim and your mental health could really like suffer. And my, my, my suggestion to everybody listening is to, is to try to create your startup from a place of strength. You know, now, now that I'm, you know, I've, I've been able to go through that process. I've been able to, uh, um, you know, understand what it's like to, to, to struggle you know, with a startup when your burn rate is high and you've got to raise capital, the, the reality is that banks or VCs don't want to give capital to people who are desperate. And that's a, that's a big part of what you have to think about and, and try to just try to start from a place of strength. Uh, I know that's not easy, but it will save you mental anguish and it will, it, it will allow you the, the chance to have, have some leverage in, in the game. So. Right. And, and Jeremy, a little perspective from you on the sort of the confluence, uh, as we spoke about, of, of social impact and, and entrepreneurship and what drives you? Yeah, you know, well, um, yeah, there, there, there's a number of layers there. Uh, I, I would say if we're looking at the big picture and holistically, I do think there is this movement um, when, when it comes to millennials and Generation Z. This new generation is highly attuned to social impact and what the future holds for them. They're going to be living much longer on this planet and they see the destruction that's like headed their way. Um, and in, ver in many ways, it's really about the social system that we've designed for ourselves that's just not working for us and not working for our future. So, you know, what's happening is that these younger individuals are now getting more access to capital, to wealth, to getting jobs, getting income, um, and in particular with crypto, it's skyrocketing exponentially. So now they have the market buying power to make demands of businesses to say, hey, we have expectations of you being better to our environment and like making sure that we can survive in this incoming future and to combat the climate crisis. So I think consumer demand in and of itself is gonna drive organizations to be much more social impact oriented and to be much more sustainable and socially responsible. And I think that's a really good thing. So I think it's just pure economic forces are gonna drive that because that's how the young generation sees and views the world. And at the same time, these young audiences are, <clears throat> are at their lowest levels of trust in institutions. Um, so, you know, surveys show that, you know, trust institutions like can be as low as 40, 30, 20 percent, uh, depending which vertical you're looking at, whether it's politics or education systems, et cetera. 
So these young um, individuals are actually looking at decentralized and Web3 solutions because it creates a trustless protocol for them to participate, have real control, but also own those assets. So I think there's this incredible movement and empowerment to the individuals and what they can do with their assets and the mobility and freedom it grants. So I think that's a really beautiful thing. Um, in terms of my own personal passions about this, you know, I think um, I, I spent most of my career in, like in the big corporate world and seeing these institutions constantly fail and not deliver value back into helping people on planet, despite reaping massive profits, like crazy, ridiculous profits. And, you know, my parents were born and raised in the Philippines and they lived in extreme poverty. Uh, they immigrated to the U.S. and I grew up in economic scarcity as well. So I lived and breathed and felt a lot of what that scarcity does to your psyche and to your mental health and your physical health. I was very lucky when my parents were able to give me an incredible life and a good education. I ended up in the tech sector. And so I got to see this disparate worlds that we all live in, this extreme scarcity. I mean, there's no reason that millions and millions of people are starving to death on this planet, given the capacity we have to produce. Um, it's insane when you think about it. Um, so to me, my, my passion's always been, how do we start to bridge that gap? How do we start to create systems that will leverage our natural behavioral incentives so that it aligns with the outputs that we really want in the world? Um, so that's, you know, I think part of the, the passion uh, behind that. Um, and I think, you know, my, my attempt was to try and change that corporate machine from the inside. And it's when I learned that profound painful lesson that altruism isn't profitable. And so corporations are optimized into their quarterly profits in their bottom line, and they won't make these key decisions to invest in secondary and tertiary benefits for the environment. Um, so, so to me, this is where I saw opportunity was, okay, now we can invent totally new economic models in Web3 and cryptocurrencies. How can we design economic and behavioral models in this space that are aligned towards the kind of social impact we want to see in the world? So it doesn't feel like a chore. It doesn't feel like extra work and extra cost for you to do something good. It feels aligned with, oh, if I do this, I'm going to get rewarded back, make money and feel good about it and, rep and boost my reputation. Awesome. Uh, so I think that's the world we want to start designing for ourselves. Um, and in coming back to statistics, millennials and Generation Z are up to like 80% identified as gamers now. 80% of this population are playing games. So everything they do in life is going to be gamified. They're going to have the expectation to enjoy what it is they're doing. So whether it's exercising or your nutrition, you can see stats and bars and progress bars and achievements and badges. Um, it, it only seems natural that social impact is going to be the next layer that gets gamified as well. Um, so overall, I think it's a, it's a good thing because we have these new levers to, to change society for, you know, for the right reasons. Yeah, no, fantastic. And, and speaking of sort of helping society in, in, in times of crisis, uh, Sadal, maybe talk a little bit more about the, uh, the niche project you're working on and really the world world impact it could potentially have. Yeah, so you know, one of the reasons that we got uh, started focusing on this space is that anywhere from, and this is kind of a conservative number, but about 30% of you know, money that gets sent deployed via grant programs and aid programs just is like burnt up and fraud, waste and abuse. And you know, currently we also have this issue where in really low resource areas where economic systems have collapsed. So for example, Afghanistan or, or Haiti where, they, where they've had either you know, man-made or natural disasters um, the, the current uh, solution for even like the State Department of moving money into these regions is to literally fly pallets of cash. Um, we talked to the State Department where they were working on the aid project and they put their employees on a plane with backpacks of cash and, you know, drop them off in these countries. So it, it's just an incredibly problematic, uh, <laughs> problematic uh, solution to uh, basically, you know, supporting uh, groups that maybe don't have access to resources at the moment. Um, and so we're really excited. One of the things we're doing is working closely with NGOs um, and onboarding communities, um, deploying crypto custodial wallets um, and using crypto rails to deploy direct aid into low resource areas. Uh, one of the really exciting things is even in places where they may not have access to smartphones, um, we're leveraging a technology called USSD where they can actually use um, basically you know, um, you know, telephone signals um, to move and transact over these crypto wallets once they have um, once they have access to the wallet itself and they've been onboarded by the NGO. So super exciting way to not only you know 
really like have a real world use case for deploying um you know crypto and capital in these communities but as we set up these peer-to-peer -peer networks um as we set up these peer-to-peer -peer networks it's also enabling um these folks to have a store of value that isn't related to what might be their plummeting local currency um and also just to you know show them what the future of finance looks like which is you know doubly exciting so that's that's the project we're working on. Um, we're really excited about where it's headed and we've partnered with a lot of great folks and, and you know, happy to discuss. Um, I actually know that our team's been talking with the Leylines team a bit. Um, so excited, excited for that and, uh, and where some of this might head. But we've talked about all kinds of things like recording the transactions uh, as NFTs and then actually using those um, to auction, auction off and generate additional profits that we can inject into that donation engine. So lots of exciting ideas. It's a very early stage project and would love any thoughts um, and uh, happy to connect with anyone who might uh, be interested in collaborating on it. Yeah, and that's fantastic you bring that up. We want this to be participatory, so we will have a little Q&A section later on. So uh, put your questions in the, uh, in the chat box and, and Monique will help monitor those. And so when we open the doors uh, at approximately quarter of five uh, Pacific time, uh, we'll engage in those questions. So, but getting back to the topic at hand, it's interesting, Sadal, you were talking about sort of the developing world um, impact and perspective of, of crypto uh, as a solution. And then maybe Jeremy, a little bit more in sort of the developed world. I'm, I'm curious uh, from your perspective, you know, what are you seeing uh, in terms of the interactions, uh, you know, developing world versus, uh, excuse me, the developed world versus the developing world? Uh, and, and how do the views of crypto con contrast? Uh, and, and what does that sort of mean for, for your project and for your work? Yeah, it's actually quite interesting because we're straddling both of those uh, different worlds. Um, you know, we're, we're appealing to this hardcore degen collector community um, that tends to be very much coming from a developed world and has expend, uh, expendable income to actually invest in these very high value collectibles, like a board eight, which for example, can go as easily as $150,000 per pop. Um, and at the same time, we're actually investing uh, through our NGO partnerships on the ground in Haiti, South Africa, Botswana, Indonesia, and now Philippines, um, is this play to earn community that's really coming in, flooding into the market, realizing, hey, I can play a game for four hours a day and earn 300 bucks a month, that kind of, that kind of um, income is already three to four months worth of salary in certain regions. So I think there's this, this, this interesting um, type of uh, psychographic profile that sees that the, the crypto world very differently. And actually you can even categorize uh, NFT projects into different verticals. So for example, you have the traditional like art collection. Um, then there's these avatars and identity and status and club membership. And then there's these play to earn games like Axie Infinity, where you're taking this free to play model, but then you're actually owning the digital assets and able to profit off of it. And each of those actually has a very different type of community, um, you know, cu customs and language and value systems and types of clubs and even where they collaborate. Um, so what we're seeing just so many different types of behavioral profiles emerge. Um, but one thing's for sure, I think the barrier to entry is still extremely high. And particularly in developed nations, there's, there's still this like genuine mistrust of having money stored in, like, in the web or on your phone. Um, they're very used to like physical cash or used to physical goods. So the concept of something being digitized and trustworthy is still a huge leap. Um, and even worse, the bigger challenge is a lot of these people aren't even meeting their physiological needs. So you can't train somebody about like the digital world and crypto when they can't put food on a table or have a roof over their heads. So you actually first have to get them to this level of stability and security before you can even begin the education and equip them into this new technology. So we really discovered a lot of these things trying to have that impact and realizing, whoa, 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 we've got to start from like negative one to get them up to zero to then start to like, you know, bring the education and then open up the opportunity for, okay, here's crypto, here's DeFi, here's staking, here's all the programs you could do to participate to earn these coins. Um, so it's a lot of hard work. And I think the, the key is actually, it's really that persistence and this, this persistent investment into these communities. Because once you do unlock that opportunity and the first moment that someone can earn that 50 or 100 or $200 um, in that community, it is life-changing. Like literally they can now start to equip their family with phones and internet using that income. They all start to generate income and so they can propagate throughout the entire community. 
so a lot of our experiments are really how do we plant the seeds, invest, provide the infrastructure, the equipment, and then the education and persist. And then we're going to see what it's going to look like one year from now, how transformative that can be for a community. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, that's the that's the hope, and you know, you know, our our internal goals are, you know, among many, is to to lift one million people out of extreme poverty through their acts of uh, charity and altruism, um, and I think this is now possible because of blockchain, um, and only because of that. And I, I just want to oh, go ahead, Sadal, please. I was just going to add real quick that one of the one of the interesting solutions that we've been uh, really excited to, to partner with is we've been using um, Stellar to actually off ramp like US dollars into via um, via NGOs into these communities where they really don't like, we're, we're battling like illiteracy and, and just as uh, Jeremy mentioned, a, a general distrust of uh, anything technology related. They love having these tactile things. So it's just like another example of there's incredible like technologies and frameworks out there that are ready to like, you know, Stellar allows us to do value transfer instantly and cross-border payments that are that are seamless and instantaneous. Um, instead of having to wait for those ACH or, or a literal plane to fly cash across the ocean. Um, so there's some really exciting um, you know, tech in place to support these low resource areas. Mm -hmm. Joe, I, I'd love to tap Please. in and, 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 and just talk about, kind of relate what we're talking about to real estate. Uh, you know, because even domestically, we have emerging markets. We have markets that kind of have been forgotten about. You know, in New York, in Brooklyn, if anybody's familiar with Brooklyn, you've got East New York. If you're in, in Miami, you've got North Miami. If you're, in, if you're in Los Angeles, you've got South Los Angeles. If you're in Philadelphia, you've got West Philadelphia. And the, the reality is that if you take a property, a derelict property in one of these emerging, emerging neighborhoods and you go to the bank and you say, hey guys, you know, I know that this property is derelict. It has violations, um, you know, but I, I, wanna, I wanna purchase this asset. So the bank is gonna say, okay, I, I, you could do it, but I'm gonna need, you know, exponentially more down payment than you would if that property was located in a more affluent, affluent neighborhood. Um, you know, we're not going to give you as much capital and our terms are not going to be as favorable uh, because of where it's located, right? And, and it's, that's simply, simply put, it's not fair, right? And I think what we're able to do with blockchain, what blockchain uh, allows, you know, me to do with the equity coin, it allows me to tap into the community who, you know, are ready, willing, and able to invest it, alongside me and alongside of our, my partners to take this derelict property and turn it into an income producing asset that not only produces money for our investors, but it also uh, beautifies the neighborhood. So I think even, you know, of course, I think it's common. We, everybody knows that crypto is best used or the best use cases are international or, or not international, but uh, in emerging markets. But I think we can even look at America domestically that we do have these emerging markets that can benefit uh, greatly from uh, um, you know, using the blockchain and tapping into the blockchain. Yeah, that's true. And, and Sonia, you'd remarked earlier about uh, some, some work you're doing in Southern California. So maybe you can talk a little bit about this uh, again from sort of the domestic uh, perspective. Yeah, well, I think that we are getting approached more and more. As a matter of fact, I'll be in LA tomorrow, actually Thursday morning to meet with uh, a crypto group out of the um, Midwest that want to talk to us about creative financing. And I just got back from Vegas last week to talk about another group that wants to um, work with us and team with us about just the whole creative financing when it comes to uh, crypto and our projects. So I just wanted to share really quick with you all that we've been doing this already for five months. So we uh, minted a coin in 18. We took it public uh, May of this year on the appropriate exchange. Uh, we had, we chose to wait the year due to uh, the COVID, but when Biden came into the administration and with Bitcoin hitting its all time high in April, we listed it in May. And the reason why I'm sharing this story with you is because I just feel like there's a little bit of a common denominator. And I think it was, uh, Jeremy, you said something about feeling good about yourself and making money. So I just wanted to touch upon that. So listen, we're a renewable energy development company. That is what we do. We are building wind farms. We want to uh, deliver a clean wind energy. Uh, one of our turbines will power 1,600 homes. And just one of our turbines deployed will offset the need for diesel fuel to the tune of 100,000 gallons per month. 
And so we're all about uh, saving um, mother nature. And so, but the thing is though, is that um, we did get, you know, we were blessed. The fact that we already were ahead of the game and minted a coin in 18. The reason I share that with you is because so many people are very, very grateful and excited because we've offered our token to the public, to the friends and family round in something called a private sale. So, so we have minimums, but to be able to go to your neighbor, your friend, your family, um, my nieces, um, my nephews, everybody's bought in, um, colleagues, again, it's called the friends and family round, but to be able to say, hey, you know, would you like to go ahead and purchase some of this crypto? Not only are you going to buy it at a reduced price because um, we're going to, that's what we're offering on the special sale versus the retail price on the exchange. But not only are you going to have a huge upswing with your portfolio, but the use of the coin, all the proceeds from the coin, it's helping us self-fund our renewable energy development project. And so, so that's really, really exciting for me because everyone, it's interesting because so many people pull me aside because they see how our coin has grown. But they're like, Sonia, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm like, well, thank you for supporting us because they're so grateful for the financial opportunity. Like you all said, you want to help the underdog, help people. So our cryptocurrency is able to do that. But the other thing is, is that a lot of people really, really care about our planet and what we're doing to destroy it is very upsetting. And so the fact that every time someone uh, writes us a check and buys some of our cryptocurrency, they know that that money is being used to further develop a, uh, an environmental uh, solution for climate change. And it really helps them feel good about themselves. And so long or the short of it is um, we own 130 acres in the Tehachapi region of Southern California, which is just north of LA. And we um, bought an existing wind farm. So I'm sure that you're familiar with the turbines that stand one to 300 uh, feet tall. So we are taking those down and we are replacing them with our vertical access wind turbines. And then we're gonna plug that into the grid um, and so we're basically just going to change the way wind energy is delivered to the market. And we're very, very excited about it. Great. Fantastic. I, I think maybe in the, the closing five minutes as a panel, before we get to the q and I just wanted to go one more time around the virtual room and, and sort of get uh, everyone's perspective on, you know, how to keep up with a fast moving uh, pace of crypto. I think we can all agree that the, the crypto space uh, you know, years uh, or excuse me, minutes and are measured in years, and and uh, it just seems very difficult to stay on top of new developments and and to uh, to keep your your um, your mind sharp and focused on what's happening uh, in real time, and sort of dividing that maybe in, into sort of two sort of verticals: one being on the business development and technology side, and the other on sort of the regulatory compliance side. Uh, what are your best tips, best advice for staying up, up to date and up to speed on anything crypto uh, for our, our audience, whether they're here as a, uh, an enthusiast of crypto, blockchain, NFTs, or actively working on a project? What are, what are some tips uh, that you can share with, with the group here? Uh, can, I, can I jump in on that? Sure. Okay. So first and foremost, if you don't have a lawyer, I would get a lawyer. I think it's very, very, very important that you have a legal team that's in the crypto space. There's something that's called a utility token and there's something that's called a security. If you cross over those lines, you're looking to do it in jail time. Let me just say that one more time. To stay in regulatory compliance, I would highly recommend that you align yourself with a, an, an attorney that specializes in crypto. I would also highly recommend that anyone that represents your company is extremely trained on what they can and cannot say to keep you out of jail. You do not want to mess around with a utility token and position it as a security. There are major laws and regulations pertaining to presenting a security. The second thing that I highly recommend is that you align yourself with the proper exchanges that are in regulatory compliance with their local state or county or uh, excuse me, country jurisdiction. The reason why we went with Probit 
and for, as our first exchange, and we are going to uh, soon be listing our, our coin on other uh, platforms, but it's because they were in compliance. It is a big deal. People don't want to mess around with coins that are not in regulatory compliance. So that would be my two cents worth for someone who's in the market selling our coin. And we have a very robust legal team. And I am the face of the company, and I'm the one who always doing the speaking because there's very um, important guidelines that you cannot re misrepresent your your offering, if you will. I hope that helps. And I, I, I'd like to piggyback off of that, um, Sonia. That's that's great advice. Um, I think, you know, my advice to people on, on the call is if you are looking to create a security token, um, then check out the uh, Delaware Blockchain Initiative. Make sure you understand uh, how to tokenize. Um, if you looked at Equicoin's balance sheet, you'll see that most of most of our capital gets spent to compliance. And you know, having a compliance officer on board from day one is essential. Um, just like Sonia said, and make sure you you make a, a distinction between utility token and security token. Um, security tokens are bound by the rules and regulations of the SEC. Uh, so you've got to make sure that whenever you do a capital raise, it's it's in the parameters. Um, it's it's right now we're, we're in this gray area, right? Where we're still looking for guidance, uh, but we do have the tools and and I, I think the rubric, uh, if you will, we have that from the government, um, and it's just important to to stay in, stay in those in those rails. Um, and then uh, compliance officer, get you know get that Delaware blockchain initiative, uh, read that up um, and then show up. You know, I think the, the, the best thing for me and the way I've been able to com connect with uh, influencers in, in, the, in the space from Dubai to Hong Kong to uh, around the country is just by going to these events. I, I mean, this is pre COVID, you know, I, I was traveling all over going to these events, but now that the world is opening back up, you know, go to, obviously you guys are here. So you, you understand the importance of connecting with people in the space but uh, show up, shake hands, and like that—that that has brought me so far. So uh, um, that's that's what I would say. Great, Jeremy Sadal. Any any closing thoughts on on that before we go to Q and A? Yeah, there it, it's it's a lot to keep up with. I have to say because you can <laughs> never sleep and still never catch up with everything. Uh, so you, you're certainly going to want to to follow really good thought leaders, very clear thinkers that are thinking systematic. Um, and generally, the topics are so in depth that long form interviews and podcasts tend to be really good ways to absorb a lot of really uh, key information. So following the big entrepreneurs or the ones that are building and doing and experimenting and failing and then learning in real time, you'll probably get a lot of really interesting insights by just listening to them talk about their experiences. I think that's a, it's a interesting way to, to pop in there. Um, the, the second one is like, there's certainly pretty decent outlets like there uh, out there, like podcasts. Um, my person, one of my personal favorites, is actually the bankless podcast there, they really, um, really generate some good quality content. Decrypt.co is an interesting feed. Um, but the other interesting thing is that all of these communities are collaborating out in the open. Everything is fully transparent. So just literally follow the communities because everything in the crypto space and Web3 is about community. If you don't have community, you have nothing. The value of your tokens is zero. So find where the big projects are, how their community comes together and just pop in and you'll see the kind of conversations that happen. They're also very welcoming because everybody in the community benefits the more people come in. So it's very pro newbie uh, in a lot of these like spaces. Uh, and whether, it, whether it's Clubhouse or Twitter spaces, um, or Discord communities, or if it's Telegram chats, um, it really depends on which vertical you're looking into. But that's the that's the beauty of it is that you can freely explore a lot of the, this the, uh, this content and information. Um, and and yeah. Jeremy, real quick on that. So when you so it's not that easy to list a coin on an exchange. So it takes it takes time and it takes money. But it also takes which I had no idea because I thought money could buy anything, not to say that that was our strategy, but it takes due diligence and, it, and it ha you have to have a following. And so in order to get a coin listed on an exchange, exactly what Jeremy said, you have to have a following. You have to have a social media impact. You have to have 
so many people, and let's just say the requirement is 300,000 and you're 280, they're like, hey, call me back when you have 20,000 more followers. Like, so, so I just wanted to acknowledge what you said, because it's very important to have your secondary market and all these people um, on social media or the exchange may or not approve you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think if you, if you drill down to what actually generates the value of a token, it's really just shared belief and consensus, social consensus that yes, this thing is valuable. And I agree with these other hundred thousand people. If you only have like a hundred people that care, <laughs> they're not going to trade it amongst themselves for millions of dollars. Uh, so yeah, community building is such an important skill in this space. So if you don't have that, you're definitely going to want to recruit in and bring that into your team. Uh, people that can really rally up a community to establish a sense of identity and values and culture. Um, and it's why you see meme coins skyrocketing, because it's all about culture and identity and ability to communicate really interesting, fun ideas with each other. Uh, so it, it seems like weird and, and ridiculous, but it actually makes a lot of sense because it enables people to rally together and form these very interesting bonds. And through the bonds, they also now believe it's like, all right, we've got, you know, Shiva to the moon, Doge to the moon, et cetera. <laughs> well, I, I guess speaking of community and in, in the interest of time, let's let's go ahead to the, the Q&A. So um, Monique, are there any questions in there or, or how can we open this up to a, a broader dialogue with uh, with the attendees? I've been trying to poke and prod them for questions, but I think everybody's <laughs> so enraptured by listening to the wisdom that's being uh, shared. I don't have anything in chat, but I will say that um, while Sadal gives us his closing thoughts, this is your last chance, everyone. Raise your hand, put something in chat. We'd love to hear from you. This is an amazing panel. You don't get to talk with these guys every day, these guys and gals. So um, Sadal, why don't you give us your closing thoughts while I, uh, oh, I see Justin. Go ahead, Sadal, and then we'll go to Justin. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, I think, you know, on, on two fronts, Twitter, uh, I find really useful for organizing thoughts and keeping track of things. And the other thing that keeps us on top is, frankly, we just have really great partners um, from, you know, everything that's been said, we have incredible folks on the compliance side. We have incredible investors who've been really early in this space. So people like Adam Draper, um, founders of Coin Fund, uh, A100X are all investors of ours. Um, and so they do a lot of work having, having just really solid people. I think like, like it's been said, uh, community and, and experts uh, who can help you along the path. Um, it's the way to go. Uh, it's, it's been the least stressful of my startups, um, mostly because I've benefited deeply from the network I've created up until now. So that's a uh, community's huge. Thanks, Vidal. Uh, Justin, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Yeah, thanks, Monique. Um, I'm just really curious, given the, the speed and the pace of crypto and, and the partnerships you all are doing, both the public sector and then with NGOs, which have a reputation for uh, you know, going in, in at least at a lesser pace, uh, if not the opposite, how do you navigate that? Partnering, building good partnerships, you know, kind of helping to move impact along as quickly as you'd like to when a partner might have a tradition of going slower. Uh, I'll just I'll just throw something out there really okay. really quickly that a lot of a lot of the NGOs that we work with um, are like realize that they need to do something new. Um, and the pandemic certainly pushed that actively. So I think there's a renewed or new sense of urgency if it wasn't there before. Um, so I'd say in our experience, people are ready to go. So what, what I'd like to share with you is the good, bad, and the ugly. So when you decide to, when you say, how are you partnering, you know, who are you determining to work with and all those things. So I would just put your, I would just be very, very laser focused on people's background. Um, there's a lot of people that talk a really, really good game. I would ask for references. I would see what projects they've worked on. I would be a little leery before I signed a contract uh, because once you sign a contract, you're married. And also understand that this is such a fast moving uh, space that a lot of people are jumping in. So they might come across like they really know what they're doing, but they really don't. So I would move forward, Justin, with caution with anyone that I would want to team up with. The other thing too, as a renewable energy development company, we also have to move with caution with our technologies. 
because there's a lot of scientists out there that they want to say, oh, you know, I want to team with you and I want to work with you. Well, we're like, okay, well, has it been tested? What are the reports? You know, do you have patents? All these things. And so just don't, don't be so excited that you don't stop and do your due diligence. That would be my biggest advice. And, and I could I could throw in there as well that, you know, NGOs come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, flavors, and, and situations. So um, there, there's an interesting, um, you know, cohort of innovators that are looking for what's like the new thing to, to reach particularly younger audiences, because the amount of volunteers and donations is actually uh, diminishing in this young generation. Um, and so they're looking for ways to how do we engage with this new audiences. So it, this is a pathway to, to kind of break into new ground. Um, those are the innovators. The more traditional laggers will tend to have a bit more hesitance. Um, and to me, what, you know, I think what's going to drive them to move into the space is just seeing this immense value that can be generated. Because um, the whole idea with our NFTs is that um, as these transactions are taking place, you just build it into the smart contract where 10% of those proceeds just go directly into the, the charity's wallet. So the more and more the volume of trading takes place, it's just passive free money for in perpetuity. So when we, when we talk to the NGOs, we're just like, all right, we're going to charge you zero dollars and we're going to generate all this money for you because it's just a byproduct of the transactions. And the people get to see the story of the impact for where their money is going and actually have that traceability. It's really a slam dunk. Um, but I think to me, it's like you'll see the early adopters move into the space where they know there's value to be created in new experiences, but then the larger, slower moving organizations will realize that after there is like this tremendous money flow already coming into the ecosystem. Uh, so you'll probably see all sorts. Um, and you know where we found the most success is actually there's a lot of actual nonprofits and charities starting up as web three projects. So like I, like I mentioned, you know this young generation is incredibly social impact oriented. And so people now realize I can start a business and actually really have this po positive impact and we could do this thing the right way. And so they're, 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 they're moving fast and um, it's coming in hot. The space is like really uh, exploding in, in entrepreneurship. So it's very exciting. <clears throat> That's awesome. I, have a, I do have a question from the chat for Vernon. Um, it's from Tremaine and he says, um, when you say start from a place of power, any advice if your startup or project is to solve a triggering tragic world issue, then challenge staying in that place of power? That's, a, that's, a, that's an awesome question. I think, you know, for, for me, when I did my first startup, I, I was beholden to VCs. You know, I, I was beholden to the people who controlled, pretty much controlled the company, even though I was a CEO. Um, you know, if you bring people on too early and you give, give away your power too early, then you become an employee pretty much. And, you know, you do those things, you do that because you need the capital, right? You do it because you want to bring your, your vision to life, but maybe it might, you might need to take a year to build up your coffers, you know, build up your cash, your, your war chest, so that you can actually do, start your business from a place of strength. Right, and and that's a key difference between uh, my first startup to what we're what we're doing here with Equity Coin, because I spent the time to build up a portfolio. I spent time to do 150 million dollars in, in real estate transactions. I, I put in that time. I put in that 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 work, and now I can I can build this at, from a place of leverage. So it's like VCs come to me. I'm like, wait, I, I actually don't want your money, you know, or <laughs> and and it's you, you can you can. You can build things uh, with a different mentality, and if you if you build something from a place of weakness, and specifically, um, you know, you want to say, you know, there's two things, you know, finance, <clears throat> finances, and then also just credibility, right? Because that that social um, currency is is big when it when it comes to startups. So having those two things and building those up in, from the beginning is going to be an inc is going to be a major help for you, even if it takes another year or two. To build that up, do do what it takes to so that you can you can have good footing, really solid footing, um, and uh, I think I hope that answered the question. I hope. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. No problem. Um, I think Joe, maybe one last question from chat, and and might be a great one to wrap up with. Um, 
a question from Lexi that says, how do you stay ahead when everything is moving so fast? So we've heard a lot about running shoes and Wild West and changing daily and all of that kind of stuff. And I think you guys listed some of the resources um, that you use to stay informed. Um, but is there any other kind of strategy that you have um, to, to, you know, to not fall behind, I guess I would say. So I'll, I'll jump in on that because it, it just happened to me last week. <clears throat> so my business partner said, hey, can you uh, jet over to the Bahamas? Um, and I'm like, okay, like why? What's the purpose? What's the objective? What's the ROI? Who am I meeting with? Um, <clears throat> so even though the Bahamas sounds fun, right? I'm not willing to just jump on a plane. I'm just not. My time is too valuable. I have to have a clear. And, and the reason why I say that is because it, these are events. It's like in the last five days, I've heard about 10 different crypto events in the last week, all throughout the United States. So you have two options. You can beat yourself up because you feel like you're missing out, or you can stop and strategize, put a 12 month look ahead calendar down, identify what all the events are, figure out a strategy. What is your main purpose of going? What are you trying to accomplish? What's your ROI? And then strategically position where you want to go. And at the last thing that I got to say, two pieces of advice. Number one, do not beat yourself up. Just don't beat yourself up. If you miss an event, you miss an event. And number two is, you're, you, you know, this is very important as a chief operating officer because I'm all about compliance and, 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 um, and uh, scaling the company up. And if everybody's a wet noodle and running around with their head cut off, there's no structure, there's no organization. So you have to stop and you, you have to really put uh, methodologies in, places, in place and you really have to work on your business because otherwise you're gonna run around and get nothing done. And so you're, you're you know, as a, as a mother, as a father, as a spouse, um, you're no good to your family if you're not taking well good care of yourself. And that would be the biggest advice I would say to any entrepreneur is make sure that you get enough sleep, okay, you drink enough water and you exercise and you pace yourself and then put a plan in place and then work your plan. A lot of people will say, how do you know, or, or I would say, how do, where are you guys headed? Like if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a direction, where are you headed in your car? So it's kind of like have a plan, work your plan, and then check your plan, and then modify it as it goes. That that would be that would be my two cents worth. So you don't kill yourself, and and you just gotta pace yourself. You know, it's like a racehorse. You cannot, you cannot let the horse pace you. You cannot do it. You have to pace the horse. And that would be uh, my final comments on that. And and uh, Sonia, just just to just to piggyback off of that, you know, um, the the market, the crypto market and blockchain in general. I, this thing in at oh, 8 o'clock. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, no, you're, the, the, you're the, the, crypt, the crypto market is super noisy. It's so noisy. You've, every day is something new coming up. Um, and if you try to pivot with every piece of content or every, every uh, news item that comes out, you're going to end up lost. And I think that the key is to always be true to your mission and if you could do that, then you can kind of block out the noise and focus on the task at hand in order to get it done. That's that's what has has been tremendous for me because, you know, like I said, every day there's something new. So stick to the stick to the plan, stick to the mission. Completely awesome. agree with we that. are over, we are slightly over time, but I'm happy to. Um, I don't know if any of our panelists has a hard stop. I'm happy to keep the, the conversation open for a few more minutes if people would like and, and let Joe wrap it up. Um, but we're at 502, so those that need to jump off, feel free. And a huge thank you. This is, what a great conversation. I just feel so honored to have you guys with us today. And thank you for everything that you're sharing with us today, but thank you for everything you're doing. Um, I just I hope this is just the beginning. I, I hope there's uh, ways to collaborate this and move forward. And I don't know why Sadal is not on Spotlight. Where'd you go, dude? There you are. Okay, so he's back again. I'm here. But uh, okay, but um, thank you. So um, Joe, last words from you, and and then I'll leave it open for a few minutes if people want to chat. 
Yeah, absolutely. A, a last words for me are just thanks. Thanks to all of you for attending and, and helping to make not only this panel, but uh, the whole of, of Global Entrepreneurship Week Sacramento, uh, what it is and, and the success it is. So thanks to all of you. And again, thanks to our amazing panelists. And as was mentioned, uh, speaking for myself, I'm happy to stick around for a few extra moments if there's one or two other questions, uh, but otherwise a profound thanks from all of us to all of you. I'm gonna jump off. Thank you very much. And you take care and everyone uh, breathe. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah, I've got to head out as well. Thanks Thank you. Me. It was uh, it's a pleasure Thank being you, here. Jeremy. And let's definitely Thank connect. Uh, actually, yes. the closing statement is that what makes Web3 beautiful is that we all actually succeed by cooperating. It's a very pro-cooperation ecosystem where it's all win-win. So uh, yeah, I'm always open for collaboration, guys. Thank you very much. I'll catch you later. All right. Thanks, A Jeremy. system of rewards Thank and incentives, you. just like Bitcoin. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Bye. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank I got to I gotta run off, too. Take care. Right. Thank right. you. Bye, everybody. Hey, Vernon, I want to follow up with you, too, but not right now. But I'll follow up with you on I sent you an email that I want to check in. With. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.